Heavenly Father, we ask that you would quiet our hearts, that you would speak through me, um, that the words that are spoken would be true, that they would accurately reflect your word. We pray that uh, it would be clear. Um, most importantly, Lord, we pray that you would use it and that it would be an impact in the lives of these dear people. We, we are so grateful for who you are, and we are in awe of what you have done for us. And when we look at your master plan through the ages, from Genesis till now and into the future, we are humbled and we are awed by the unbelievably beautiful tapestry that you have woven through your word and through human history. And we thank you for your love for us and for your love for humanity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Over the last uh, several weeks, I have been uh, contemplating what the Lord would have me share with you um, for this morning. And um, I'd been doing a lot of reading and thinking, um, reading scripture, um, some excellent books, and I had so much information, but I felt that it was um, pieces in isolation, if you will. And I asked the Lord to, over the last several days, to help me bring it together um, in a way that I could present it, uh, hopefully, that will, be, that will bring the pieces into harmony um, for you and to give you something I, I trust that you can take away from this session that will be of benefit to you. And uh, what the Lord drew me to in terms of the thread of what I want to be speaking about this morning is Abraham, Isaac, and the Lamb. And you know, I wrestled and wrestled with the title and I came up with something I think very simplistic because there's so much that are, is contained in the account of Abraham and Isaac. And I hope that you will maybe see the story of Abraham and Isaac in a fresh and new and exciting way um, this morning. Any discussion of Abraham and Isaac, you have to go back to the book of Genesis. And I always like to look at things in fuller context or the fullest context possible because I'm a firm believer that when we look at things within a context, we gain greater insight into the particular account or story within scripture that we're looking at. And so in this case, I end up going back because it's so crucial to this account of Abraham and Isaac. It is foundational to everything, not just the story of Abraham. It is foundational to all of us. And I go back to the Garden of Eden and the time when Adam and Eve fell when they rebelled against their creator God. And God pronounced a curse specifically on the serpent that seduced Eve into sinning. In Genesis 3.15, God says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Ladies and gentlemen, this specific verse is crucial to our understanding of the entire plan and program of God through the ages. Because this, at this pivotal juncture, humanity had sinned. We had lost, as it were, within Adam and Eve, we had lost our ability to do what God had intended, which was to rule and reign over the earth as God's vice regent over what he had created. Because of sin and the virus of sin that had entered into humanity and eventually through to all of humanity and to you and I, we lost that special privilege that God had imbued into his creation and Adam and Eve. And at the pivotal moment when they sinned and humanity was now forevermore 
at least until the second coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ at his death and the second coming when he brings it all to fruition, that sin manifested itself in a virus within all of humanity. And at this critical juncture, God says to Satan, I'm placing a curse on you. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between, and here it is, thy seed, Satan, and her seed, Eve's seed, the seed of the woman in Genesis, Eve. This is the first indication that we have that there is a messianic program that God is putting in place for the salvation of humanity, for the redemption of humanity at Genesis 3.15. A critical juncture and an indication that God has a plan to redeem his lost creation. And what was pivotal within that plan? A seed that would come through the woman, through Eve. And ladies and gentlemen, from this moment forward in the book of Genesis, you should understand that the thread of where and who that seed would be, where the seed would come from and who the seed would be is the focus of the entire rest of the book. There are other important components that take place within the book of Genesis. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, you'll see that there are lots of genealogies, right? Genealogies of this person begat this person and this person begat this person. It's all there for a reason, a crucial reason. And it all goes back to Genesis chapter 3.15 because God's program for the redemption of humanity would come through the seed of a woman, through Eve. It would be a human that would be born at some point in the future. And so the question, the primary purpose of Genesis is to identify who the messianic seed will be and where he will come from. That explains the thread of the book of Genesis. So let's take a brief look at that thread and that genealogy. Eve gives birth to Cain and to Abel. And if that is where the story ended, those of you who know the story of Cain and Abel would understand that we have no hope because Cain killed his brother Abel. Cain offered the first fruits of his garden. He was a farmer, if you will, and grew crops. He offered to the Lord the first of his crops. Abel was a sheep herder, and Abel offered to God the first fruits, if you will, of the sheep, the best of the sheep in the fold. And Cain was angry because God did not look favorably upon his offering to the Lord, but Abel's offering of a sheep. Cain was so angry that he killed his brother, Abel. However, the story doesn't end there because Eve now gives birth to Seth. And from Seth is born Noah. Noah. And you all know the story of Noah. But what happened when Noah was upon the earth? The earth, the population of the earth was wicked, was licentious. And God had Noah build an ark. And except for Noah, his wife, his three sons and three daughters-in-law, the entire world perished. However, when the ark settled on the other side, on Mount Ararat, Noah's three sons essentially repopulated the earth. But we're told that one of the sons was through the righteous line that God would eventually bring the promised seed. Noah's three sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
And listen to what God says in Genesis chapter 9. The story behind these verses that we're taking a look at here regarding Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The story is related to Noah at the other side of the flood. And Noah was growing grapes in a vineyard and had too much to drink, was intoxicated. And he was unclothed within his tent. The father of Canaan, who you see in this text, Ham, he mocked his father Noah. And when Noah, when the intoxication wore off and Noah saw his three sons, he understood that Ham had mocked him and embarrassed him. But his other two sons, Shem and Japheth, took a fabric cloth and backwards went in to hide their father Noah to maintain his dignity and their respect. And in this text, the son of Ham, Canaan, is cursed. It says, and he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. In this second verse here that you see, God shall enlarge Japheth, more than likely what the text is saying is God shall enlarge Japheth, and God shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Because in the previous verse, it says, and he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. So in the next verse, and he, God, shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. But here's the point. Clearly, with the three sons of Noah, God was delineating Shem as the, as the individual through which the righteous line and eventually the promised seed would come. From Shem, we move on to the father of Abraham, Terah. And from Terah, Abraham. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 10 and 11. But let's keep going. From Abraham, we know from scripture in many locations that it was through Isaac, not Ishmael, the son that Abraham had through his handmaid, Hagar, but it was Isaac shall thy seed be called, we're told in scripture, through Isaac. And that was through the union of Abraham and his wife, Sarah. So you have Abraham and then Isaac. And Isaac gives birth to Jacob. Jacob. Now, the question is, once we get to Jacob, Jacob, we know, has 12 sons. So from which of Jacob's 12 sons will the messianic redeemer or the seed promised back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, come to ultimately crush the serpent's head? Which of the sons or the tribes will the promised seed come through? And we know that it is through the tribe of Judah. The text tells us the scepter, and this, ladies and gentlemen, this is in Genesis 49. In Genesis 49, one chapter before the end of the book, we're told that the scepter or kingship shall not depart from the tribe of Judah. Now, what did I tell you earlier? That Genesis and the whole concept of the book is designed to take you and answer the question of Genesis 3.15, there will be a seed that would come to redeem humanity, to redeem humanity. And the rest of the book is paring it down to give us an understanding of where and who that promised seed would be and where he would come from. And we get all the way to almost the end of the book, Genesis chapter 49, and we're told after all of the genealogies, the scepter or kingship shall not depart from the tribe of Judah. From the tribe of Judah comes eventually King David. And from King David, eventually Jesus 
the Messiah. So you see the entire book of Genesis is identifying the problem of humanity, the virus of sin, and says, how is God going to deal with the virus of sin to redeem humanity back to himself? You see, God can't cheat. He can't fudge a little bit on the details. He had a plan and a program to stay consistent with who he was, his divine nature, his divine attributes, and a means by which you and I could be redeemed to God. And in Genesis, what he is doing is he is defining for us where that promised Messiah that would bring redemption to you and I and all of humanity, where he would come from. And we know it's from the tribe of Judah through King David, and ultimately it was Jesus the Messiah. So that's the 30,000 foot view of the book of Genesis. But now I want us to zoom in specifically, knowing all that tucked away in the back of your head because it'll come back into play later. I want to zoom in on the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac. So turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to read through the story, and then we're going to go back and we're going to highlight some things for you. And it came to pass after these things that God did, and your Bible probably says, tempt Abraham. The idea is not tempt. The idea is to test, to test Abraham, to see what he's made of, what, what kind of stuff he's made of. So it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, here am I. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. And I remember hearing as a youngster my dad teaching on this passage. And, and when he got to that point, he said, I don't know about you, but he said, that is one morning that I would have slept in. <laughs> it always impacted me. And I, it, it, it caused me to think. It's easy to read over this passage without the emotion, without the pathos, without thinking through what must have been going through the mind of Abraham when God told him to take his son and to offer him as a sacrifice. And we read in verse 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled the donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Amazing. We don't read about any excuses. We don't read about any, well, God, maybe you made a mistake here. Are you sure? This doesn't sound like a good plan to me. There's none of that there. He rose up early in the morning. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here are my son. And he said, Behold, the, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told of him, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know 
that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now I want to pause for a moment, and I want to take you back to the beginning of this story, and we will conclude the story a little bit later. But I want you to understand something very important. That while this story was historical and true and accurate, it is far more than history. Because this story is giving us insight into something that would happen more than 2,000 years later that would impact you and me directly. You see, this story, while true, also gives us many symbols and creates a dynamic by which it is obvious to see that we are talking about more than Abraham and Isaac. This story gives us a glimpse into what God himself would do for you and I more than 2,000 years later at Calvary. I want you to look as we go through and I want you to see some comparisons from the story of Abraham and Isaac and what God did at the cross with Jesus Christ, his son. Take a look at verse 2. God said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Do we have a reference in scripture speaking about thine only begotten son? Speaking of Jesus in relation to God the Father? Absolutely, in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The same language used in Genesis 22 with the story of Abraham and Isaac, and the same language used with God the Father referring to Jesus Christ, his only son. And what does it say in the text? And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. It couldn't be any clearer in the text. Whom thou lovest. Do we see a reference between God the Father and Jesus Christ? Turn, if you will, to John chapter 17. Jesus is speaking here in John chapter 17, verse 23. And he says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me, Jesus says. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ is speaking about the love of the Father toward him. Whom thou lovest. Back to Genesis chapter 22. There's some other interesting things in the text as we move through. We get to verse three. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. Interestingly enough, during what we would term Palm Sunday, 2,000 years later at the time of Jesus Christ. How did Jesus Christ ride into Jerusalem? On the back of a donkey. And incidentally, Jesus sent how many disciples to go find the donkey? Two. In the text here in Genesis 22, there were two young men that came with them. 
when Jesus died on the cross, how many men were next to him? Two. Two. Interesting symbolism uh, in the text. Let's keep moving on. Verse 4, Genesis 22. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place where God was leading him to offer his son from afar. Don't skip over it. It was the third day. It was the third day. What is symbolized by the third day many times in scripture? Resurrection. Resurrection. So here it is that Abraham arrives on the third day where God had told him, I want you to offer your son Isaac as a sacrifice to me. They arrive on the third day. Um, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So here you have in Genesis 22 a clear reference to the third day, and this relates to something we'll be taking a look at here in just a moment. Look at verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. Did you notice the way the text is phrased? Very important. Did he say, I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and I will come again to you? That's not what he said. He said, I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and the inference clearly is, and I and the lad will come again to you. Did you get it? The way the, the grammar is written, I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and the inference is clearly, and I and the lad will come again to you. In the previous verse, ladies and gentlemen, in verse 4, we just looked at on the third day, which is connected to resurrection. Turn over, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 11. This is known as the faith chapter. Look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Let me give you some context here briefly. In this chapter, the author is showcasing stellar personalities from the scripture who were all considered champions of faith in God. And Abraham is listed among a list of others, which is an amazing list of those in scripture who had unwavering faith in the face of overwhelming odds. So by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place, God called him from Ur of the Chaldees, and he said, I want you to go to a land that I will show you, which was ended up the land of Canaan today, the land of Israel, which he should receive after, after receive for an inheritance. He obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Look at verse 17, Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. This is Abraham. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Through Isaac, not Ishmael. Verse 19. And this is key. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. 
from whence also he received him in a figure. Ladies and gentlemen, when you read in Genesis 22, verse 4, that it was on the third day that Abraham arrived, it's not by accident. It's not a coincidence. The third day spoke of resurrection. And in the next verse, Abraham says to his two young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And the idea, I and the lad will come back to you. And we don't find out for sure what was in Abraham's mind until we get to Hebrews chapter 11, when the writer tells us that Abraham's faith in God was so strong that God, to be true to the promises that he had made Abraham, to make of him a great nation, and that a promised seed would come through him and all the nations of the world would be blessed, Abraham understood that God, to be true to his promises and his covenant, if Abraham was required to take the life of his son, that God, to be true to those promises, would have to raise him from the dead. That's the faith of Abraham. And so he says to the two young men, I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and we're going to come back to see you. I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and we will come back. Verse 7, verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. So the object of what would be used for the sacrifice, the wood for the burnt offering. Abraham the father took and laid it upon his son Isaac to carry as it will to his sacrificial death. What happened when Jesus stood before Pilate and he was condemned to death by crucifixion, and he walked the Via Dolorosa. What did God the Father lay upon him? A wooden cross. A wooden cross that he would carry to Calvary. Let's continue reading. And Isaac, verse 7, spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Did you catch the wording? God will provide himself a lamb. Not just any lamb. You see the idea here in the text, looking 2,000 years further into the distance, not by coincidence. Not only would God provide the ultimate lamb, but he himself would be the lamb clothed in humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Let me ask you a question. When it says they went, both of them, together, Isaac wasn't just a little guy. We don't know exactly what age he was, but most likely he was at least of teenage years, and there are some who believe that he was actually closer to 32, 33 years of age. When it says that both of them went together, you know what it's clearly saying? They were in agreement. 
they were in agreement. Abraham was an old man. At any point in the story, Isaac could have pushed him over and ran away. Both of them went together. 2,000 years later, when Jesus came to be born in the little village of Bethlehem, he knew that his purpose was to die for the sins of humanity. He was in total agreement with the plan and purpose for his life on earth with his Father in heaven. Two of them walked together. Verse 9, And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And once again, Isaac was being bound for it to be a sacrifice knowing that there was no lamb in their midst. He could have easily run away. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And if you've ever seen an artist's impression of what that scene might have looked like, you would have seen an altar. You would have seen Isaac probably bound in some type of ropes or straps. And most likely you would have seen Abraham standing there holding a knife in his hand as if to, he was about to stab his son. And ladies and gentlemen, while it is gory to think about, most likely that would not have been the way that Abraham would have anticipated killing his son. It would have been most likely slitting the neck. And I tell you that, not for shock value, I tell you that so that you feel the emotion of what Abraham must have been going through. And I tell you that because it gives us amazing insight into what God the Father must have been experiencing when his son was being crucified Amen. on a cross. Let's keep reading. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. Can you imagine how Abraham's heart felt when he heard those words from heaven call his name twice? When God calls you twice, you better listen. <laughs> and he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed 
shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. If you look back at verse 16, God says, by myself have I sworn. It kind of sounds a little strange. By myself have I sworn. Do you know when people take an oath, normally what they will do is they will take an oath upon someone or something greater than themselves. I swear on, or I promise on, something that is reverential and higher and greater than themselves. But in this text, when God says, by myself have I sworn, there is no one or anything higher than God himself. He swears by himself, his own name is on the line if he doesn't hold true to his promise. By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because, Abraham, you have done this thing. What thing? You have evidenced unwavering, rock-solid faith in what I have told you to do. That in blessing life and goodness Life and the goodness of God upon that life is blessing. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Your seed will rule and reign. Verse 18, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've ever read the story of Abraham and Isaac and you said, that's nice, what a lovely story, and look at the faith of Abraham. Ladies and gentlemen, your eternal destiny hung in the balance as to whether Abraham would believe God and follow what God had told him. And God says that because you did this, Abraham, in blessing I will bless thee, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be, be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Do you know what was happening here? If Abraham had failed and was not an individual of faith, what would have happened to his eventual seed? And eventually the promised Messiah who would come to die for your sin and for mine. Abraham came through with flying colors. He got an A++ on the test that he took, and you and I should be forever grateful for his faith. Do you know, if you look back in the text, it says, and Abraham in verse 14 called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. Do you know what Jehovah-Jireh means? It's a name for God. Jehovah-Jireh, the Lord will provide. He named the place where he was about to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And God stopped him at the last moment and provided a ram caught in the thicket. And he named the place the Lord will provide. But ladies and gentlemen, that was only the near-term fulfillment of what was taking place. 2,000 years later, God provided the lamb. God provided the lamb. And I want to tell you something. He provided the lamb in the same place on the same mountain all those years later. When we get to the New Testament and we get to Jesus about to begin his ministry three years prior to his death, burial, and resurrection, 
he's down in the area of the Dead Sea region. And he's in the presence of what we know, the person we know as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. And what happened as Jesus was approaching John in that context? It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was revolutionary to the people who were there. They had never seen a two-legged lamb. They'd only seen four-legged lambs. And they knew four-legged lambs very well because year after year after year at Passover, which is just a short time from now, at Passover, Jews from all over the region around the world would come to Jerusalem. Scholars estimate that it could have been anywhere from a quarter of a million to two to three million Jews would have descended or ascended up to Jerusalem with lambs to offer at Passover as a sacrifice to God for their sin. But you know those lambs, those four-legged lambs, could never take away sin. They can only cover it for a time. And they had to come back year after year after year to offer those four-legged lambs as a sacrifice to God. But when John the baptizer sees Jesus coming, what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God. This is God's provision for sin. Two-legged, human, upright. Behold the Lamb of God that could do what no other lamb could do. It could take away sin. But it was so powerful that it could take away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb. So when you think back to Genesis chapter 22 and you hear the words when Abraham answers Isaac and Isaac says, Father, I see the fire, I see the wood, I see the knife, but I don't see the lamb. Abraham responds, My son, God will provide himself, himself, the lamb. And 2,000 years later, that's exactly what he did. Amen. He provided the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a schematic of the city of Jerusalem. From everything we can read in scripture, there are essentially two locations which scholars believe are the location where Jesus died on the cross and where he was buried and where he rose again on the third day. One of those locations is here at Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The other one is called the Garden Tomb or Gordon's Calvary. They're very close together, but today one of the sites is inside the city walls of Jerusalem. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is very built up and it is very crowded and there are several different denominations that share the church in kind of a, a difficult alliance. But there are some historical facts about where the church rests on top of what it rests upon which would give credibility to the fact that that may indeed be the site of where Jesus was crucified and where he was buried. But there is another site that is today a beautiful garden. In the midst of a bustling city, it's a beautiful garden. There is a large cistern there indicating that there was a large garden there historically. Uh, there is... Uh, a rock formation which today looks like a skull that is there. 
and that is in this location. We know historically that crucifixions would have taken place, and in this instance with the crucifixion of Jesus, it would have taken place outside of the city walls. However, what you should understand is before you just discount the location of Church of the Holy Sepulchre, because it's inside the city walls today, you should understand that as the city of Jerusalem grew, it added walls, particularly to its north. So the original first northern wall is down in this area. This is the temple area. And as the city grew, they added a second northern wall in this area. And today, it is very difficult because of the challenge of excavating on top or through the city, it is difficult to determine exactly where this second northern wall would have run. And this would, be, this would have been at the time of Jesus. So we don't know if this second northern wall put this site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre inside of the city walls or outside of the city walls at that time. And it's almost impossible to excavate to determine that. What you see here, this larger wall, this was a third northern wall that came later. There's not much of that that is still remaining today. So when you look at Jerusalem and you see the old city, basically you can see this gray line and this burgundy here is the city wall that you would see today. That would be the extent of the wall. And the garden tomb is outside of that city wall that was the extent of the city of Jerusalem at the time of Christ. So this could potentially be the location. What I would suggest to you is that both sites have credible data to suggest that they may be the place where Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. I leaned towards the garden tomb, uh, not only because when we visit there, and Lord willing, we'll be going in a few months, um, because it is tranquil, um, it is beautiful, it is managed by believers, and there is a large tomb there. The garden is wonderful for prayer and worship and reflection. But I also lean towards it, tied to the passage that we just looked at here in Genesis 22, because this Temple Mount area is thought to be the location of where Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. Moriah is actually a range of mountains, but this is known here where the temple is, where the temple once stood, um, as Mount Moriah. And while you can't see it very clearly here, is that this site, the garden tomb, is on the same ridge line as the Temple Mount. There is a valley that runs through the city called the Teropian or Cheesemakers Valley, right behind uh, the western wall of the Temple uh, Fortress, if you will, what is known as the Wailing Wall today. And that valley separates this ridge of Moriah from the hill and the slopes and, uh, on the other side where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre would be. It is not conclusive, but I lean towards that fact because of the connection between Genesis 22 and Abraham calling, this is the place where the Lord will provide. 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ is offered. But ladies and gentlemen, the issue is not whether it's here that it took place or there that it took place. The issue is that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, in fulfillment of everything that God had promised in his plan and program for redemption, all the way from the promise of a seed in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, all the way through the story of Abraham, which gives us an amazing picture of God the Father giving us his son, as a lamb to take away our sin on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years later. But I wanna take you to one more verse because you could have heard all of this and you could think intellectually it's correct and it makes sense and it's amazing what God did. But I wanna take you back to Hebrews chapter 11 because in this great faith chapter where we read about Abraham and his understanding that God to be true to what he had promised, that if he took the life of his son Isaac, that God would have to raise him from the dead. In that same chapter, listen to what the author of Hebrews says. But without faith, 
it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, ladies and gentlemen, you may never be a great statesman. You may never be the head of a corporation. You may never be a great singer that's on television. You may never be at the top of anything that you're pursuing. You may never be the best. But you can be what Abraham was. You can be a man or woman of faith. You may never be any of those other things that you would have wished for in this, in this life. But you can be a person of faith. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you from the depths of our heart for your plan and program, for your love for us, for the means by which you have redeemed us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Amen. And as we are approaching Passover and, and the resurrection time where we celebrate our Lord's rising from the grave. We know and have the assurance that because Jesus Christ rose again, that all of those who have put their faith and trust in his finished work on the cross of Calvary will rise too when he returns to this planet. We thank you for that indescribable gift that you have given to us. We thank you for all these dear friends, and we pray that you would bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.